convolution of continuous time signals is best evaluated graphically. Now recall that convolution relates the output of a linear time invariant system to the input in terms of the impulse response. We can write the output y of t as the integral from minus infinity to infinity of h of tau x of t minus tau d tau, and this is known as the convolution integral. Now why should we learn how to evaluate this integral graphically? Well, the most important reason is that by doing this, you'll develop insight that allows you to predict and analyze system behavior. If you understand what the impulse response looks like, you can often visualize what the output will be for certain types of inputs. In general, convolution cannot be evaluated exactly with a computer. The only way to do it is analytically, and the graphical approach is the most useful of those. Finally, convolution occurs in other contexts, such as when we do windowing and take a discrete Fourier transform. And it's useful to have the intuition as to how that convolution is going to affect what we look at in the frequency domain. So our procedure for evaluating this integral is going to consist of three steps. First, we're going to evaluate x of t minus tau as a function of the independent variable tau. Then we're going to evaluate this product, x of t minus tau times h of tau. And then last, we'll evaluate the integral or the area under that product. We're going to form x of t minus tau as a function of tau. And when we do this, we're treating t as a constant. So we'll start off with some x of tau. In our first step, we'll replace tau by minus tau. And this generates x of minus tau. And that's a reflection of the signal about tau equals 0. On the right here, I've reflected x of tau about 0. Then in the second part, we're going to shift this reflected signal. We're going to take x of minus tau. And in that signal, we're going to replace tau by tau minus t. So if you do the algebra there, in place of tau, place tau minus t, and you apply the minus sign out front, and you end up with x of t minus tau. This transformation of the independent variable amounts to shifting x of minus tau to the right by t. I've shown that here. And the key thing to remember when you do this shifting is that whatever occurred at 0 in x of minus tau will now occur at time t and x of t minus tau. This edge here occurred at time 1, and that's going to occur at time t plus 1. And then this edge on the left occurred at time minus 2, and so that'll show up as t minus 2 in x of t minus tau. It's really important when you do this to view t as a constant. So the independent variable is tau, that's what we're integrating over, and t is a constant with respect to this integral. So we found x of t minus tau, then we're going to graph h of tau and form the product x of t minus tau h of tau. And then in the third step, we'll evaluate the area under that signal, or the integral. I'm going to start off, in general, for a negative value of t, and then I'm going to take x of minus tau and shift it by t to get x of t minus tau. Then we'll form the product, find the area, and then we'll increase t. And we'll repeat this process to find y of t for all of the values that we're interested in. Now we can think of this as taking x of minus tau, putting it on a conveyor belt, and as I increase t, I move it further into the factory here, and then it's going to interact with h of tau and we'll find the area. Now the other thing that happens is you'll find that for certain ranges of t, you have a particular form for this product. And it's often very useful to recognize those ranges of t because that simplifies the overall process. And I'm going to start with an example where I have two rectangular pulses. x of t has amplitude 1 and it's non-zero from 0 to 1, whereas h of t has amplitude 2 and is non-zero from 0 to 2. I'm going to do the convolution of these two signals. First, I need to graph x of t minus tau as a function of the independent variable tau. So I'm going to start off with x of tau, reflect this about the origin to obtain x of minus tau. We'll replace tau with tau minus t to obtain x of t minus tau. Whatever was at the origin in x of minus tau now shows up at time t because we've shifted this signal by t units. 
So what was at minus 1 is now going to be at t minus 1. Then in step 2, we're going to form the product of x of t minus tau times h of tau. And as I said, it's useful to recognize that for certain ranges of t, we often get the same answer. So for example, here's h of tau, and here's x of t minus tau, and we've got to visualize the product of these two signals. Now if t is less than 0, then x of t minus tau is over here, and it's 0 times 0, so the product always ends up being 0. Now once t gets a little bigger than 0, let's say it's between 0 and 1, then this rightmost edge is overlapping into the non-zero portion of h of tau, but this leftmost edge is still to the left of 0, because t is less than 1, and therefore the product is 2, and the value 2 holds between 0 and t. Now as I increase t a little bit more, this back edge is going to pass through this point, and this rectangle, which is one unit wide, will be entirely contained within h of tau. So that's the case I've drawn here, what I'm calling case c, where t is between 1 and 2. So in this case, I've got 2 between t minus 1 and t. We're recognizing that there's an entire range of t for which this particular form is valid, and that helps us in the end get our answer more quickly. Now if I increase t further, once t gets bigger than 2, then my right edge of x of t minus tau is to the right of 2. I'm going to have this edge now define where the function goes to 0, and then the left edge of x of t minus tau will be in this interval, and so that edge defines where it goes to 0 as well. So now I have 2 between t minus 1 and 2. And then the final case is when t is greater than 3, because in that case, this rightmost edge, which is going to occur at a time greater than 2, will be to the right of this edge, and the product again will be 0. Okay, so now we've found the product of x of t minus tau times h of tau, and we've found that it's useful to list it in several cases. So we're going to move on to evaluating y of t by finding the area under each of those products. We'll start doing both case A and E, because in both of those two cases, we had the product was exactly 0. So, of course, then the area is 0. So y of t is 0 whenever t is less than 0 or t is greater than 3. Now, in case B, I redrew x of t minus tau times h of tau. If we find the area under this signal, we've got y of t being 0 to t of 2 d tau and that integrates to 2t. So when t is between 0 and 1, y of t is 2 times t. And you can see that as t increases, the area here is going to increase as well. Now in case c, I've drawn again here what we had for x of t minus tau h of tau. It was 2 between t minus 1 and t. So y of t then is going to be the integral from t minus 1 to t of 2 d tau. It's just the area under this signal, and you can do that calculation easily enough, and you find that the area is exactly 2. And that is valid whenever t is between 1 and 2, because that was what case c applied to. You can see that the area isn't changing as t changes as long as t is less than 2 and t is greater than 1. Now in case d, we had that the product was 2 between t minus 1 and 2 for tau. So we could find the area under this function as the integral from t minus 1 to 2 of 2 d tau. And if you do the integration, you end up with an expression that's 6 minus 2t. And that applies whenever t is between 2 and 3. So now we've found actually the result for all the values of t because we are able to identify ranges of t for which these special cases applied. And we can graph y of t as I've shown down here. It's 0 for t less than 0. It's also 0 for t greater than 3. Those was our case a and e. And then when t is between 0 and 1, we had case b, and it was 2t. So that's a line with slope 2 and intercept 0 at the origin. So it, at 1, it achieves a value of 2. And then we saw that between 1 and 2 for t, 
that y of t holds constant at 2. And then once we get to t values greater than 2, we have a slope of negative 2. If you evaluate this at t equals 2, you get 2, 6 minus 4. So it's 2 here, and then it decreases to 0 when we get to t equals 3. So there's our answer. And we basically went through these three steps. And in step 2, we recognized that for different constant values of t, we had different forms for the product, x of t minus tau, h of tau. And then we could treat those cases independently when we put the answer together for finding the area at the final step. Now we'll do another example. And in this case, I'm going to find the convolution of x and h when x is a step function that's delayed by 1. So this turns on at time 1, and then it stays at a value of 1 for all t greater than 1. And h of t is an exponential that's decaying, and it turns on at 0, and then it decays from there. So in step 1, we're going to form x of t minus tau as a function of the independent variable tau. So I'm going to graph x of tau, and this is u of tau minus 1. It starts at 1 and turns on to value 1 and stays there for all greater values of tau. I reflect that about the origin to get x of minus tau, and that's going to be 1 for all values of tau less than minus 1. And then we're going to shift this by t to find x of t minus tau. And so what was at the origin goes to time t. So this point here was one unit to the left of the origin, so it's going to be at time t minus 1 in x of t minus tau. So now we've got to form the product of x of t minus tau and h of tau. Now I've graphed h of tau here, and we see that it's 0 for tau less than 0, and then it's e to the minus tau for tau greater than 0. Now clearly, when t is less than 1, then the right edge here of x of t minus tau is to the left of 0. And the product of these two functions is going to be exactly 0. Now once t starts to get greater than or equal to 1, then there is overlap between the part of this signal that's at unity and the non-zero portion of h of tau. So we can write the product as e to the minus tau between 0 and t minus 1, and then it's 0 elsewhere. So that concludes step two, because this is going to hold no matter how big t gets. So we only needed two cases to describe all the possible values of t. But within each of those cases, remember, we're looking at tau as the independent variable here. And with respect to this independent variable, we're treating t as a constant. We're just considering multiple possibilities for t at the same time. So then in the next step, we find the area under these products, x of t minus tau, h of tau. In case A, where x of t minus tau, h of tau is 0, we're going to have y of t to be 0, and that's when t is less than 1. And then case B has y of t, the area under this function here, which is the integral from 0 to t minus 1, e to the minus tau, d tau. And you can perform the integration to obtain 1 minus e to the minus quantity t minus 1. And that applies for t greater than or equal to 1. So we can graph this result, the convolution, and we have 1 minus the exponential, so that's going to turn on at time 1, and we'll have an exponential rise, and then we asymptote to the value of 1 as t gets large. Now the final comment I wish to make here is that it's very simple to do convolution with impulses. And this comes up in a variety of scenarios that we'll see later. And the result is as I've written out here, is that if I convolve any signal x of t with an impulse that occurs at time t0, the convolution is just x of t minus t0. In other words, if we have an impulse at t0, we end up shifting our signal by t0 units. And this is not something I'm going to prove in this video, but it's a consequence of the sifting property of the impulse.